Shading can be a hairy affair. And for a business, success often stands on a razor's edge. Is the medicine cabinet too packed to keep the grooming business booming? Or can this company redefine what it means to be smooth? For anyone who only started shaving in the past few years, you don't know how good you got it. Look, in the old days, buying razors was a horribly frustrating experience. You were subject to the whims of a powerful oligopoly that could charge you a fortune for little bits of plastic and metal. Even today, uh, buying razor blades in person, uh-uh, huge pain in the neck. Don't like it. Then companies like Harry's and Dollar Shave Club moved in with a subscription-based business model. You know we think this is the subscription-based economy. You'd order the razor online, and they start sending you recurring shipments of blades for a low monthly fee, much less than you pay for a four-pack of Gillette Safety Blades. These discount shaving plays have now captured massive market share and brought the incumbents to their knees. And that's why Unilever and Procter Gamble both made acquisitions here. If you can't beat them, I guess you'd join them. And a couple of weeks ago, we learned that Edgewell, that's the maker of Schick and Wilkinson Sword Razors, is is doing the same thing. They're buying Harry's for $1.37 billion in cash and stock. I think it's a brilliant move. But the stock market disagrees as Edgewell's stock plunged 15% on the news. To me, that seems wrong. This is one of those situations where you either become a disruptor or you get disrupted, and Edgewell's making the right call. So let's dig deep with Rod Little. He's the president and CEO of Edgewell Personal Care, along with the two co-founders and co-CEOs of Harry's, who are sticking with the company, Andy Katz-Mayfield and Jeff Frader, get a better sense of this transformative deal. Gentlemen, welcome to their money. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Okay, so Rod, uh, one of my favorite analysts is uh, Bonnie Herzog. I've known her from when I was a hedge fund manager. She goes, congratulations on the deal. And then another thing I don't know, uh, Ali um, Dibaj from Sanford Bernstein, he says, hey, how would you defend this succinctly, the more cynical view here? I apologize for saying this, but the acquisition smacks of a little bit of desperation. How can one analyst say it's desperation and the one right before them say congratulations? What's going on here? Yeah, Jim, the, the simple answer is there's not a good comp for what we're doing. Comparable. Not a good okay. comparable for what we're doing. Um, we are building what we think is the next generation consumer products platform uh, that perfectly blends complementary capabilities that when we look at our competitors or other in the space, it, it hasn't been put together this way before. And so we, we on the Edgewell side have a fairly short history. We're only mm. publicly traded for the last four years, spun out of Energizer. So our story is a little unknown. Uh, we have a total shareholder return track record the last four years that, that's not great, frankly, being honest. Uh, but we also have a new leadership team uh, right. in the company. Ten top positions are all new to the company uh, or new to position. And we have a transformation that's been underway for a year. And so people don't really see who we are right, going to be. Early. Still early. We're changing the company We're very changing radically. the company. And frankly, this acquisition is the centerpiece of accelerating that transformation. Because on the Edgewell side, we have great technology and IP mm -hmm. around blades and formulations. We have global scale, infrastructure, and we have a great portfolio of well-established brands. On the Harry side, they have digital marketing, they have brand building, design, a direct-to-consumer mm -hmm. platform that you talked about right. earlier, and an omni-channel capability to grow at retail. Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, really the formation of Harry's. Uh, you, like me, Andy, uh, you don't like the way the, way the store, but the way. give me what made you get angry enough to do this. Yeah, so... Back in 2011, I had sort of a nervous breakdown in a drugstore. You know, the razors were locked in a case, right. and they were overpriced. They were overdesigned, um, and the whole experience just... You didn't like all that plastic? I did not love the overall shopping You didn't like experience. the landfill aspects? The, <laughs> the brands didn't resonate. Um, I fortunately had a good friend in Jeff um, who... Uh, We've known each other for a long time. He's actually co-founder of Warby Parker um, oh, eyewear okay. business, which was founded out of a similar frustration. Um, and so we set out to just build uh, a, a shaving brand and ultimately a men's care brand um, with a different approach that provided great value, right. differentiated design, um, and uh, you know, with a real sort of consumer-centric mindset. And then uh, we went to market. Okay, so Jeff, uh, when I look at it, it's, Warby Parker is very interesting because it's it, great looking. The product is great looking. The presentation. I love the way this looks. Did you design it? And you obviously are far from just doing razors now. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we think of Harry's as a brand 
that, as Andy mentioned, has to be customer first and to do whatever is right for the customer. Right. And when we thought about the brand, we wanted it to feel warm and approachable um, and very much there for our guys. And so we started online to get to know our customers, right. to be able to control the brand narrative. Over time, we've expanded the brand. You know, we started by expanding to specialty retailers mm -hmm. like Barney's and J. Crew. Today, Harry's is available there. It's available at Target. What's going to ask you? I mean, we, we, we have a huge staff of people who love your stuff. And one, one of our guys gets it. Uh, at Target, though, yeah. doesn't that defeat the purpose? No, because as we as a brand feel like we have to be there for him at Target and we have to be there for people who want to buy online. And we think we need to be there across more products to help guys with everything they need to do in the morning. We are a customer-centric brand that needs to be best in class in all the channels that we play in for our customers. And we listen to them, we get to know them, and then we're there for them. And we hope to be there in ways that are different than how they're expecting other brands to show right. up so that people don't have nervous breakdowns. But No, I mean, but just the opening experience. the plastic is just impossible. You take the scissors, does it, I can't. I'm not strong enough to open it. I'm re reasonable. <laughs> so, Rod, let me ask you. Uh, this is a very expensive product. This is what I shape with, okay? Is, does that fit with the rest of the products? I mean, or is this an aspirational brand? Yeah, it is an aspirational brand, Jim. It's, it's a high price point. It's prestige-only distribution. Um, but when you look at, at where we're going as a company around global grooming, men's skin care, it's a category that's growing rapidly. The products are amazing. And interestingly enough, it's a founder-led brand that we acquired about a year ago, and it's doing very well. So and we learned great. a lot from that right. that we can apply here. Well, I'm just always surprised. Look, these brands are great. And the, it, women, pretty popular, right? Yeah. 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 We uh, recently launched Flamingo, um, which is a women-focused brand, both online and at Target as well. And it's having success in both of those channels. And um, it was a brand that was built uh, by women on our team with mm -hmm. women in mind um, and trying to sort of solve the consumer needs in that segment the same way we were able to solve it in men's. And, and just yeah. one last thing. Talk to me a little bit about sustainability, how important it is to you, because obviously the old days are not, the old brands are not sustainable. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's incredibly important to us. Um, we literally, uh, on all of our packaging, right, give a shave, uh, recycle. Um, and we think that, you know, that's an important message that we've always had within our team. And it's not only on us from where we are today, but we need to innovate here. If we're going to be a next generation CPG platform, we need to lead the way in sustainability. And can you change everything like the way one, I want to total sustainability. I mean, frankly, I, you know, I, I'm just not into the plastic. Yeah. Jim, grab the Bulldog Razor package right okay. there. It's all paper. Like that. That's what I want. Right. There's no plastic in there. The, hand, the handle's a recycled bamboo handle. Uh, all sustainable, that's the roots and heritage of that brand. So we cool. have the capability, we've set ambitious targets, and we've staffed the team up to go after sustainability. Well, I think it's terrific what you've done. Congratulations, congratulations to you guys, really doing the right thing, really doing the right thing. Thank all right, that's Rod Little, President and CEO of Edgewell Personal Care, Andy Katz-Mayfield, and Jeff Rader, co-founders and co-CEOs of Harry's, who once again are staying with the company. Stick with Kramer. Booyah! Jim Cramer here from Mad Money. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube. Click here to subscribe and get the jump on my exclusives with CEOs, plus market news, investing advice, and a whole lot more.